So this is this is week five of what was planned as a six week series. And originally I had planned to teach every week because I love this topic and I, I just enjoy engaging with all of you. But one of my colleagues at Candler, uh, a woman by name by the name of Elizabeth Arnold, she goes by E.B., E-B-B-Y. She is a New Testament scholar and is an expert in Luke and Acts, that two part volume in the New Testament, Luke Acts, she's an expert. And it's fortuitous because Luke Acts is really, if I had to pick any place in the New Testament to focus on it, it, with this broader question of the Bible and poverty, it would be the writings of Luke. Because in Luke and Acts, the issue of poverty and, and uh, economics really rises to the surface far more than it does in the other gospels and even in the letters of Paul. So I've invited Evie. Uh, to come on and teach next week. She's an extraordinary, extraordinarily good teacher, pastoral and scholarly in, in equal measure, and you will absolutely love engaging with her. So I'm sad that I won't be there to lead the way in that class, but you will love Evie, and so the course will continue with her next week. Same time, same place, same Zoom link. You'll just have a different speaker uh, with you that morning. And friends, let me just add my own words of gratitude and appreciation for the invitation to come and engage with you all and on this topic. I love the topic. Um, and just specifically and personally, I've been loved engaging with you, particularly on this topic, your insights, questions, your hospitality and graciousness are such a gift to me. And this is what gets me out of bed, not just on a Sunday morning, but generally in my vocation is to engage with church groups just like yours on these topics that I think connect biblical and theological reflection to issues and questions that really matter to the world, to, to the church, and to the communities that we love and serve. And so I'm so glad to have had the chance to engage this with you. I hope that this is not the last time that we engage. Um, this, might, this course might continue in some other form uh, of engaging the issue of poverty, as Tom said, from maybe even more of a practice-centered perspective, but I also hope that we might engage together with other topics. The broader initiative that I oversee at Candler called the Candler Foundry is designed to do things just like this, offer seminary type learning and engagement activities for people who might never go to seminary. So probably most of you would fit in that category. We want to bring classes and opportunities for theological exploration to churches just like yours. So I'm hopeful that without agenda that we might have ways to connect uh, on other topics and in other ways going forward. Uh, but for this morning, um, oh, and I should say too, that I volunteered when I was discussed, Bright let me know that she'd be down in Florida. I told her that I would be happy to accompany her to Florida and teach the class from there. Um, but apparently there wasn't enough room in the inn for me to travel that way. And I hadn't quite cleared it with my family. So here I am still in Decatur uh, teaching this course and being with all of you. Um, we have still so much to do in this course. I mean, to give you a frame of reference, when Bright and I first engaged on this topic, it was in the context of a 14 week semester length study of the Bible and poverty. So to condense that bigger treatment down to six weeks means that we necessarily don't have time to really reach into every nook and cranny of scripture. And there's so much more friends that we could engage. There's so much that we won't get to, even though we've already covered a lot of ground. And here in my last week with you, I, want, I have some unfinished business with the Psalms that I wanna talk about. There's, a, there's one particular aspect of the Proverbs that I think is important to engage. And then if we have time, I'm gonna to begin to set the scene for the study of the gospels with respect to poverty. And what we don't get to with respect to the gospels, my colleague E.B. will pick up next week. So that's the plan for this morning, a little bit of Psalms, a little bit of Proverbs, and then hopefully uh, beginning to look forward into Proverbs. So with that said, let's, let's begin. I'll share my screen here as is my practice. And we will say our little prayers to the Zoom gods uh, that this goes through. You all can see my screen, thumbs up. All right. So I've got a question that I want to begin uh, this study with, and it's it goes something like this. Um, ancient Israel believed and acknowledged that other gods existed. So they didn't think that there was just one God out there, the God that goes by the name Yahweh. Uh, they believed that other gods existed. And, and what was distinctive about the religion of ancient Israelites 
was it was really a matter of which God would you choose to serve among the many gods that the other nations knew? And that came down to a question of what made Israel's God or Yahweh distinct? What made that particular God worth worshiping when there were other options out there, whether it was Baal or Asherah or so many other ancient Near Eastern gods, what made that God worthy of praise and adoration and worship? This question is really in the background of Psalm 113. This is a psalm of praise. There's a type of psalm in the Psalter called Psalms of Praise that really are an extended poetic form of doxology. And this particular psalm was thought to be said later on uh, during the Passover celebration, namely in the, in the beginning of the Passover um, celebration. And it begins like this. It says, praise the Lord, praise those servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Now here's the key line. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks down uh, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. And the presumed answer to that rhetorical question is no one. No other God is like our God. No other God is like Yahweh. The question, friends, is why? What sets Yahweh apart? How would you answer that? Um, or I, I'm curious how you thought the Israelites answered it. And I'm also curious about how you would answer that. Uh, with respect to your understanding of what's unique about the God that we worship in Christianity. So how would you, let's get generate some conversation around that. What do y'all think? I'd say he's a, a righteous God. Righteous God. Okay, that's good, Tom. I like that. He, he's the creator. Creator, right? Good. He made everything, yep. including, including other gods. I mean, you know. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cares for the poor. Yeah. Cares for the poor. Okay. That one would expect that answer in a course in the Bible of poverty. I think you're absolutely right, and I'm going to show that to be true. But I would argue that that's not the answer we typically give. Right. If you ask the confirmation class, and I don't know what age you all do confirmation at Trinity Pres, for instance, but if you ask the confirmation class, like what is distinctive about our God? Like what's the what's the what are the main characteristics of the God that we worship? My suspicion is you would get what I call the omnis. Now, what I mean by the omnis are uh, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and my personal favorite, although it's not often cited omnifarious and that means of or relating to many different things and many different components these are the sort of like theological abstractions about god's power god's sovereignty god's role in creation that we often cite as really the distinct markers of what the god is uh, that we worship of the god of israel the god we know in jesus christ and i have no objection to any of those attributes they are amazing and worship inspiring but friends as you can guess and as sam has directed us already that's actually not the answer the ancient israelites consistently gave to the question why this god what makes our god incomparable well psalm 13 uh, is one place where we see that answer spelled out clearly. It continues. So remember, it just said, who is like the Lord our God? And then now it's going to give the, 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 the job description, essentially, of a deity. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. No mention here of God's role in creation. No mention here of God's sovereignty or providence or strength or power or omniscience or anything like that. Now, that's not to say that those things are unimportant, nor is it to say that ancient Israel didn't believe in those things. But when it came down to the point of what makes Israel God's distinct, it's God's concrete actions on behalf of the economically impoverished 
in the world. And this language here is, is really extraordinary. Take this line, I'll just highlight a few pieces of it. You see that line there in the second part of seven, he lifts the needy from the ash heap. Well, in, 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 in the English actually makes it sound better than what it really is in the Hebrew. You see in the Hebrew, that phrase ash heap means something more like uh, heaps of garbage or maybe even something like a manure pile. In the book of Nehemiah, uh, there's reference to the dung gate. It's the place where human and animal excrement was dumped uh, after uh, it was just sort of like a dumping ground. Well, the ash heap that the NRSV translates is really a nicer way of referring to that dung heap. It's right outside a particular gate, and it's not a gate that you want to hang out at or be anywhere around. Right. And so notice then the play on imagery here. So he lifts the needy from the dung gate or from the ash heap. And then um, he has then in, in verse eight, it says to make them sit with princes. Well, here again, there's some language that to that beneath it that's important. The word here for princes is not the term that Hebrew typically uses for royalty, the son of a king. The word for princes here, I think, would be better translated as like nobles or the well-to-do or the wealthy. And that term is much more of an economic term than it is a, a royal term. And uh, the nobles, the wealthy, the elite, where they would sit is at the main gate of the city. The main gate of the city were places where decisions were made. Think of it as sort of like a uh, a, a town hall or the place where city council would meet or the state capital or something like that. And so notice the juxtaposition, the needy are in the dung gate and the wealthy are in this, like the center gate, the main gate. Notice sort of the, the transformation that happens that the needy are not just raised up, but they are placed here at the main gate, sitting with the wealthy in this position of belonging, in a position where their voice matters, in a position where they have say in how the city is run. That's the sort of transformation that this God brings to the people. Another thing I want to highlight, and then I'll, I'll pull back and get your reaction to this, is look at verse 9. Uh, it says, he gives the barren woman a home. Now, what's striking to you about that? What would you expect God to give the barren woman? What's sort of like the obvious thing? What's the, what would it meet the barrenness of, of the woman? We yeah, have a child. A child, right? Yeah. They, they would give the barren woman a child. That's the, that's the main deficit that the word barren names is that this person can't have uh, any descendants. But, and there's other parts of scripture where barren women are given a child by God. There's actually a lot of examples of that from, uh, from Sarah uh, all the way to Elizabeth in the New Testament, right? There are plenty of examples of that. But the language here, I think, is not accidental. It doesn't say he gives the barren woman a child. It says he gives the barren woman a home. And here's what I make of that. The word home, by it uh, in Hebrew, it means more than just the physical kind of, you know, brick and mortar structure in which one lives. It can mean a household. And with the household, it can mean property. And as we've seen throughout this course, if one does not have property, which would have been the case uh, for many barren women, then one is necessarily poor. But if one has property, if one has a buyet or a household, then one has the agency and the means to subsist and, and to, to produce for oneself and not to be impoverished. So while it's true that God gives, in, in many cases, the a barren women a child, this particular verse is highlighting that God uh, enfranchises uh, the barren woman who is poor to have this access to provide for herself, provide for her family, and have a means of subsistence. I think this particular language is highlighting an economic transformation as it much as it is a biological transformation that allows the woman to have a child. So let me get your reaction to this, this idea that, that, that God's unique profile is, uh, it has to do with concrete action for the poor. Kind of process this with me. What do you, is this surprising? What questions does it raise for you? I think a part of it is to think of God in that way means to have a relationship. So for us to think in the way that it was written, 
you have to have that relationship to describe God. So when we get the meanings or we ask a question, you know, what makes God different? If you don't have that relationship, if you haven't had an experience to know, then you do get the omni answers. Mm-hmm. Okay, Because it's just what society or the world to say, there's something bigger than us. Right. But to answer that question is different once you now have a relationship. Mm-hmm. I remember as a child, always asking my mom, what does it mean to have the Holy Spirit? And, you know, she'd always answer, well, you'll know when you know. Right. And so you have to have that relationship because it almost doesn't have a description, even though she had that. It didn't have a description unless I had the relationship. So I see that as a different way to answer the question. Great. Thanks, Cindy. Any other re- reflections on this? Uh, Ryan, I, I think this is Reynolds. I feel like that, uh, you know, it's a it's just a testimonial to faith. Uh, he does the the. The psalm doesn't say he raises all the poor from the dust. Mm-hmm. He doesn't lift all the needy from the ash heap. He doesn't give all barren women a home. It just, you know, it says that he is capable of doing this. And he does it sometimes to some people. And you have to accept the fact that everybody doesn't experience this. And it's not, it's not their fault. It's not God's fault. It's just the way things are. Maybe it, maybe that's a little sacrilegious, but uh, to me, it makes sense. If I'm, if I'm faithful, then I believe that he has, he has the power to do that. And he may do it, but he may not. But that doesn't deter me from being faithful. Mm-hmm. That's good, Reynolds. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Ryan, one thing that strikes me is these, these verses that you've cited throughout the course, and, and this one is a good example, or not really... Uh, I'm not, I don't think I've heard them uh, before, really. And they're not, they don't seem to be particularly favored by the church. Uh, for, you know, probably for obvious reasons. It makes you uncomfortable a little bit to, uh, to have to focus on, uh, you know, you'd rather hear how God's going to do something for you or how he's going to save you or prosper you. But when uh, this, is, this is the other yeah. comes into play and it, it can make us uncomfortable. Yeah, well, I'm really glad you named that, Tom. And I think, I think that's right. I mean, these are this is good news. This is gospel, friends. It's gospel for uh, the poor and disenfranchised, for folks who are marginalized. And uh, we see that same message, that same gospel, that same good news embodied in Jesus. And Jesus didn't invent this idea that that the poor and the marginalized have a special place in God's heart. This is true all throughout our scriptures. But it's not always what is brought out to us through our education, through the sermons we encounter, through confirmation curricula, through the hymns we sing. It's there in our tradition, but we haven't had access to it, uh, or many of us, I don't want to paint with too broad of a, a stroke here, but many of us have not had access to this sort of formation. But I want to suggest that ancient Israel saw this identity of Yahweh as at the very heart of what it means to be a follower of God. They, they, they didn't see this as secondary or, or, uh, or something one picks up down the line through a special course. It was there as sort of a creedal confession of what God was like. Let me give you an example of that. Um, because that one question that comes to mind is, well, where does this idea come from? What is Psalm 13 drawing on to get this idea. Well, it's already there. This idea is already bedded, embedded deep in Israel's theological tradition. And one place we see it is Deuteronomy 10, 17 and 18. Um, for, and you can hear a very similar language. Now, this is God speaking to Moses. For the Lord is your God, is God of gods and Lord of lords. That's another way of saying like, this is the top dog. This is the, this is why this is the real true God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribes. So now we're starting to move into concrete actions who executes justice for the orphan and the widow. Remember they would have been necessarily poor in the ancient world, orphans and widows, and who loves the strangers. That's the refugee providing them food and clothing. See here in this text from Deuteronomy, we see that God's concrete actions for those in need is at the core of what Israel believed about its God. In fact, this verse and the surrounding context of it 
kind of, uh, this is a bit of an anachronistic way to say it, but this is sort of a creedal confession. If, if ancient Israel had confirmation classes, uh, this is the chapter and verses that they would focus on. This maybe is the, the verses they would recite to session, you know, when they become full members of the church. And I don't think Israel did that, but Presbyterians do that very often. Um, you know, this is their core belief. Like this is what makes you a part of the community is believing that God is this way. And I can't help but think that verses like this are exactly the verses that parents would have taught kids and that would have been studied in temple and synagogue. And when one learned Torah, one almost would begin with passages like this that named what Yahweh was like. It's their friends from the very beginning. Um, it's central to them. And so my plea and my hope is that somehow these testimonies about what God is like would one also become central for us and in our faith communities, that we would come back to places like this. Again, not to do away with the omnis, but to realize that, that who God is has to do with poverty as much as it does with omniscience or omnipotence. Um, now, let me give you a variation on the theme of this idea of God's incomparability. And that's in uh, Psalm 82. And this is a strange Psalm because what the language we get in the very beginning imagines God seated around some assembly of the other gods. Now that's a weird thought for us because as Christians, we're monotheists uh, and we think that that there is only one God that, as I said before, that's not how ancient Israel thought. They were not monotheists. Here's your here's your fun uh, theological term for the morning. We had latifundialization and stuff. So let me add another one. This is called monolatry. Monolatry is the belief that there are many gods, but that you worship one God as supreme above the other gods. Ancient Israelites were um, believed in monolatry, not monotheism. Monotheism is something that comes along later and is in place by the time we get to Jesus, but is not properly reflected in most of the Old Testament. So you get a sense of this monolatry here in Psalm 82. God has taken his place in the divine council, that is, this assembly of the other gods. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So Israel, through this prayer, is imagining God with the other gods holding judgment. And, and Yahweh, this other God, is about to pronounce judgment on the other gods. And let's see what how, how the form of that judgment. Now, this is God speaking to the other gods. Uh, verse two, how long will you judge unjustly? He's accusing the other gods of unjust judgment and show partiality to the wicked. Give justice to the weak and the orphans, maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. What is Yahweh accusing the other gods of? Favoritism. Favoritism. Okay, keep going with that. Favoritism to whom or on behalf of whom? Uh, favoritism of those who, who uh, uh, are not poor. Yeah, favoritism towards the rich. People in the community. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and remember that the referencing back to Deuteronomy 10, the passage we just looked at, remember it says, God does not take a bribe or show partiality. Now here's what the, the other gods are being judged for, who have shown partiality to whom the wicked. I think here the wicked is implying the rich. Now, not that all rich are wicked, of course, but in the context of, of what follows, I think the wicked refers to those who would oppress the poor. So these gods are, these other gods are being judged to be false gods not because they didn't create the world, not because they're not omniscient. They're being judged to be false gods because they, unlike Yahweh, do not stand up and defend the poor and the needy, right? What a remarkable thing to say. It goes on, um, verse five, it says, they, these other gods, have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness, now, the reason I'm highlighting this passage is that in other Psalms and also in various places in the prophets, idols, these false gods of other religions, idols are described in the exact same way. 
They have, they neither have knowledge nor understanding and they're blind. That is, they walk around without perception. Uh, they walk around in darkness. So I think to put those two pieces together, I think what this Psalm is saying, um, a deity who does not care for the poor is a false God. And, and by definition, a deity that does not care for the poor is an idol. Um, they, 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 the failure to maintain justice for the poor is what distinguishes a true God from an idol. It's almost as if caring for the poor is the test of true divinity. Israel can't imagine a real God not caring for the poor and favoring uh, the rich. That is what distinguishes God from idol in the theology of ancient Israel. What an amazing testimony of the centrality of poverty to Israel's whole uh, theological system, what it basically believed about God uh, hinged around this topic, right? Um, let me give you one other example before we move on uh, to the Proverbs. There's so much here in the Psalms, um, and I'm a big fan of the Psalms, so it's hard not to say a little bit more about these topics, but there's one other dimension of poverty that I wanna highlight, and it has less to do with Yahweh and more to do with the responsibility of the king, of the supreme ruler of ancient Israel. What responsibility did the king have with respect to people experiencing poverty in his realm? Well, Psalm 72 lays out a picture of what the king's responsibility was. This is almost as if we're getting a, a job description of ancient Israel's king and it's framed in form of a doxology so this psalm is celebrating ancient israel's king and it doesn't say uh well i'll say who, what specific king it's a reference to you can see it there on the top line it says of solomon i'll say more about that in a second but this could be applied to any king uh, in ancient israel's history and uh it, it probably would a prayer like this would have been prayed maybe when the king was uh, coronated the first time or maybe on the anniversary of the king's coronation day. So this was a sort of a prayer in praise of the king. But in it, we find a description of, um, of, of what the king ought to do. It reads like this. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he, the king, that is, judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Note how quickly Care for the poor rises to the surface in the job description of Israel's king. May the mountains yield prosperity, not for the king, but for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he, the king, defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy and crush the oppressor. For he delivers the needy when they call, the poor and those who have no helper. This is the king again. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy from oppression and violence, the king redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. Who does the king sound a lot like? <laughs> Yahweh, right? The king is supposed to reflect Yahweh's priorities and commitments. We've just seen this language of being applied to Yahweh. Now it's saying, look, the king uh, who's made in the image of God, like we all are, but the king made in the image of God as God's kind of designated leader, the king is successful when the king embodies and manifests God's commitments to the poor and the needy, right? So it's sort of... Um, it's a job, it's an aspirational job description, because as we all know, kings don't always do this, do they? Kings don't always, or maybe often, uh, privilege the interests, desires, and needs of the poor. Kings very often privilege the interests, desires, and needs of the rich and those who are invested in keeping them in power and, and, and supporting them in their ambitions, right? Um, this is not something kings often do. And sadly, it's not something that Israel's kings often do. Did And this brings me to that little line in the very beginning there uh, of Solomon, 
Do you see that there? And I've highlighted it in green. Now, this is called a superscription. And superscriptions were not part of the original text. Uh, interpreters added these superscriptions at a later point, although we read them in our New Testament, and, and it seems like they're part of the text originally, but there really weren't. Um, and the language here of Solomon, it doesn't mean that Solomon wrote this. It's not that sense of of Solomon. The word that gets translated of means more, uh, means something closer to a dedicated to or with reference to Solomon. So it's not authorship. It's saying that when you pray this prayer, think of Solomon. When you pray this prayer, uh, pray it with respect. To, to Solomon and what you know about Solomon. Now, what do we typically associate Solomon with? What, why might the person put Solomon's name here as part of the superscription? What do we think of Solomon? What, what, what attributes or accomplishments come to mind when we think of Solomon? Wisdom. Wise. Wise. Wisdom. Wise, yes. What else did Solomon do? There's one other big accomplishment along with wealth. the wisdom. He had, he, built the he had great wealth. He had great wealth. And what he particularly... Built the temple. Didn't he build the temple? Built the temple. Yes. Very, yeah. very good. He built the temple. Now, we typically think, because we you know, look up to the temple, and the temple has an important place in Christian theology. Um, but, when we, but what we often miss about the temple is we fail to ask, how did Solomon get the money to build the temple? Like, how did the actual construction process happen? Does anyone know that? This is a text that does not come up in sermons or in the lectionary or in Sunday school classes. Does anyone know? Taxes. 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 <laughs> Super high taxes. Oh, slaves. Yeah. And, and who were the slaves? Slave labor. Who were the slaves? Were they like people that Israel had conquered? Probably. <laughs> they were Israelites. Solomon enslaved his own people to do forced labor to build the temple. And on top of that, he uh, levied these enormous taxes on his own people to build the temple. We can debate about the value of the temple, and I have a whole other study that would lead us into that. But the fact we need to keep in mind is that Solomon's, this grand temple that Solomon built was built on the back of the poor. Literally, it was built on the back of the poor. So oppressive were Solomon's economic policies of forced uh, labor and high taxations. Uh, this is the other thing that we don't hear in Sunday school, is that that's the very reason, Solomon's oppressive economic uh, policies are the very reason why the 10 northern tribes rebel and eventually split off to form their own nation. Remember how Israel splits into two nations around uh, 922 or so BCE? Well, the reason for that was Solomon's oppressive taxes. And if you can think of the geography of ancient Israel, the temple and Jerusalem is in the south. But where Solomon raises taxes and where Solomon recruits his fourth forced labor is in the north. So not surprising at all, right, that the north eventually says, you know, what's going on? Solomon is building a, a, an elaborate temple and palace that's really not for us. And we are the economic base. We are basically being treated like Israel was treated when it was enslaved in Egypt. Solomon does to his people what Pharaoh had done to the Israelites. And so, friends, when, when, the, the, when the, whoever puts the superscription here with this psalm of Solomon or in dedication or in reference to Solomon, he's not referencing Solomon's wisdom. He's rather referencing Solomon's mistakes. I want to suggest to you that Psalm 72 is meant as a counter to Solomon. It's meant as a reminder to say, look, this is exactly what Solomon didn't do. Let's remember what a real king's responsibility is. Solomon did not live out Psalm 72, and that's why the kingdom crumbled. That's why he lost control of the, or I should say his successors lost control of the 10 northern tribes. It's precisely because Solomon's actions did not measure up 
to what is laid out as a priority for the king in Psalm 72. So I think it's, um, I guess what I'm suggesting is that the superscription uh, invites us to see this as a critique of Solomon more so than an affirmation of Solomon's wisdom. Um, does that make sense? I'm kind of bringing some different threads together. Let me get your reaction or, or thoughts about that. Make sense? Well, my reaction is how similar it is to what, what's going on today. And that so much of what we have was built on the backs of the poor. And, and so here we are in the deep trouble that we are about race and, and other things because of our failure to acknowledge what we did all those years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what if this became our barometer uh, or our sort of framework for evaluating our rulers and our leaders, right? Uh, what if this was the metric by which we elected city council people or governors or mayors or presidents? What if this were a metric for who we called to be senior pastor or who we called to lead our churches, right? Now, those are complex questions. I don't mean to, to oversimplify, but I want to suggest that this was the measure of what made a leader a true and faithful and righteous leader in the ancient world. It wasn't there. Uh, well, anyway, I'll stop there. <laughs> I, I have commentary I could add, but I'll just stop there. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, sure, Joe. <laughs> were, were the Israelites any better than we are? <laughs> or is this a, just the status of the human condition? <laughs> Gosh, Joe, I, I don't think that the Israelites were better than us um, in that regard. I think, if anything, the Old Testament, you know, the Old Testament is not a story of, of these faithful uh, people who we are to emulate. The, old, the good news of the Old Testament is that God remained faithful to a people who look and act a lot like us. That is, we just don't often get it right. Um, mm -hmm. David didn't get it right. Solomon didn't get it right. Moses even had his flaws and mistakes. We um, th these these figures. Um, what we find in the Old Testament is not a model of, of of action that we are to follow, but we find these principles, right? We pr we find ideas like Psalm seventy two that are to be like an aspirational compass to how we are, how we are to live today. So it's, um, I don't think Israel gets it much better than us. Now that there are exceptions, right? There are some really great examples that I think are inspiring, but even as someone like Solomon, and again, I have a whole tangent here, but in the New Testament, we often, or uh, sorry, not New Testament, in the church, we often teach Solomon as this great hero. And Solomon does have attributes that we ought to lift up. I mean, Solomon's wisdom in certain regards is praiseworthy and and is a great model for us but solomon is we don't we should not whitewash solomon solomon mm. had his flaws and by understanding them uh and understanding where he went wrong in his economic policies that might guide us and shape us as much as what solomon got right and we need to keep in view i think both of those things who do you think wrote this ah. who, who wrote what the attributes of the king should be? Well, I think, I don't know specifically, this is one of the elusive parts of the Psalms that we don't really have any insight on authorship. Um, they come probably from a temple context. Um, so it's reasonable to think that a priest would have written this down. But I think if it's a priest, it's a priest who is deeply familiar with Deuteronomy 10 in what we read about God, what we read about God's profile. And I think what's happening here in this Psalm, and it happens elsewhere too, is that God's commitments are thought to be uh, emblematic of, or a mirror for what the king ought to be committed to. So I think there's that sort of theology is in the background. I, I don't know specifically who though would have written it. Although it was someone who knew that theology, someone who was deeply familiar uh, with that tradition of what Yahweh, what made Yahweh distinctive. Yes. All right, friends, there's more to talk about, but I want to give us a glimpse of Proverbs uh, before we get out of here. Now, the reason I turn to Proverbs 
is that on first glance, the pro Proverbs says some things about poverty that seem to cut in the complete opposite direction of almost everything we've said so far. And so I want to address that and begin to think about what's going on with how uh, some parts of Proverbs talks about poverty. So here's what we're going to do. Let's look. I pulled out a couple select verses from Proverbs that I think represents this, this view that is quite challenging or, or is just, it's not really quite in line with what we've talked about so far. And so here are those verses. Um, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Whoever loves pleasure will suffer want. Whoever loves wine and oil will not be rich. Do not love sleep or else you will come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will have plenty of bread. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats with, will be bursting with wine. And then finally, misfortunate pursues, misfortune, excuse me, pursues sinners, but but prosperity rewards the righteous. How would you put in your own words the, the sort of assumptions uh, about wealth and poverty that you see in these verses? Gonna be lazy, you're gonna be poor. That's, that's kind of the feeling you get right away that is connected to you not doing enough. All right. <laughs> Early bird gets the worm. I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> Hard work has its rewards. Okay. It's your fault if you're poor. <laughs> ah, right. It's your fault if you're poor. Now, what do y'all think about that? I mean, is there what? Do you agree? Do you disagree? What What have we we been learning? How kind of reflect on that piece? I think we would all disagree, but that's a lot of what's going on today. That's what I was saying. There are many, many people who think that if you didn't work hard enough, if you didn't weren't able to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, then you deserve to be down there in the poverty lane. Right. That is a very common understanding today. And friends, what's hard, and we just have to name this uh, as people of faith, is that the people who see it that way can quote Proverbs mm -hmm. to support their view, right? So they can say, this is a biblical view of poverty. It's the fault of the poor. It's because they're lazy. That's why they're impoverished. And people who are well off, well, they, they're just hardworking, right? And they have biblical verses to support it. Um, friends, I, I think you would not be surprised to know that I, I disagree with this view. I think the picture is way more complicated. Um, this is not to say that someone who is impoverished uh, can't be lazy. I, I don't want to completely rule that out in, in, in every single case. But what we've seen from this study and what we know from the world is that people end up poor very infrequently just because they're lazy. Um, they end up in poor because of systemic issues uh, that, that disadvantage them from the start and for reasons that, that often aren't their fault. So if that's the case, if I'm right about that, how do we make sense of Proverbs? Like what is going on that leads to these particular views? Well, I wanna, I wanna give you some footholds for understanding uh, the, these verses. Um, and three points in particular I wanna highlight. The first has to do with context. And in particular, we need to think about who are these proverbs written for? Like in their original authorship, who did the author think he was writing to? And, and this is a place where proverbs is really different than many other parts of scripture, especially the Psalms. Uh, scholars think, and there's a, almost a, a, a unanimous thinking on this point among scholars, that the Proverbs come into existence in the educational circles of the wealthy and the social elite. Now, that's not true of the Psalms. It's not true of Deuteronomy and Exodus and other things. But the Psalms really are framed. If you go back and read through the Psalms, it's often advice from a father to a son, right? So it's very educational. It's very pedagogical. It's sort of training in 
you know, uh, in, 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 in what's required of life and, and, and things like that. Um, but it comes sociologically in the home of, uh, from the context of the social elite and the wealthy. Um, the, the Proverbs more than any other part of the Old Testament is connected to the king's court and the king's officials. So in other words, the people writing the Proverbs and the people receiving the problems, uh, Proverbs are people of means. There are people who came into the world with means. These are the sons of the wealthy, people in, in control more or less of their economic destiny. We must remember that for the most part, the poor are not in control of their economic destiny, at least not in the same way that the sons of the wealthy are. For this particular group, poverty is completely avoidable. Uh, these sons of the wealthy would have been buffeted against crisis situations, and they often would have been the beneficiaries of economic advantage. The point to emphasize then, if you're instructing wealthy children about economics, the point to emphasize is personal responsibility in relation to economics. In particular, you want to talk about practicing good stewardship with the money that you have inherited honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Um, the assumption here is that these people are born into a world where they have full barns in the first place. And the question is, how will you use your wealth? How will you use what's been given to you, right? That's a different question, a, a question that applies to the sons of the wealthy uh, in particular. There's also an emphasis on not squandering wealth. Whoever loves pleasure will suffer want. Whoever loves wine and oil will not be rich. I think this is a particular comment with respect to those who are already wealthy. This is a, not about how you become poor generally. It's about how you go from being rich to poor in the first place. The, the New Testament story that comes to mind for me is the story of the prodigal son. Remember yeah. how that, that story goes. He inherits a lot of wealth when he, um, well, when he asks for in his inheritance before his father dies, he gets a lot of wealth. And that story then shows how he squanders the wealth with a particular way of living. That's what the Proverbs are addressing. They're addressing someone who has money and here's what, here's how not to act in order to squander your wealth. So in that context, um, you know, if you are a drunkard or if you are lazy, like the prodigal son, you might also lose your wealth. So are you following me here? Like the context, who this is told to matters a lot. We should not and ought not to extrapolate that the reasons for the prodigal son losing his wealth are the same reasons why uh, people who are not born into means end up poor. So this applies to only a very particular group of people. Are you with me on that so far? Yeah, but let me ask you about stewardship. That implies if you give, you're going to get. Now, <laughs> I, don't know, I, I don't know that that's right. I mean, you might get in your heart, but, well, I, I, yeah. that bothers me. Well, and it should bother you because this sounds a lot like a health and wealth gospel. Right. You know, if, if you do X, Y and Z, then God will bless you materially. Right. A lot of health and wealth gospels <laughs> uh, preachers today have made a lot of money off of this sort of theology. Joel Olstein comes to mind, but there are many, many others who represent this health and wealth gospel there. I, I wish I could get into this completely. Um, and this is would be a nice little mini series in its own right. Um, but suffice it to say that um, this particular view of how things work in the Proverbs is countered by other parts of scripture. And it's countered, namely, by other wisdom books in the Old Testament. Job and Ecclesiastes, which are also uh, classified as wisdom literature, they present a really different view of how the world works. Job and the author of Ecclesiastes knows that good living does not always or even often lead to material blessings. So we need to acknowledge that this is in there, but also acknowledge that it is 
intentionally countered in, or put in tension with other things that scripture has to say about wealth and, and blessing. Now that that's not a full answer to that, but I, uh, I, it, it, it's, uh, I think you're right to have some caution around this uh, simple connection between uh, if you do X, then God will bless you with money. All right, let me go on. Let me do the second thing. So the first thing is we have to keep in mind who this uh, is being spoken to. The second thing we need to keep in mind is terminology. And remember, we talked about sort of the vocabulary of the Psalms of Lament and how the, the person praying the Lament Psalms identified uh, him or herself. Um, well, what's really interesting about the Proverbs is that when it comes to poverty, the word that the Proverbs typically use is not any of the terms that we encountered in the Psalms. The word that the book of Proverbs uses with respect to poverty is maksor. And maksor doesn't mean to be uh, you know, uh, poor or needy in want. The word maksor has the connotation of a lack of luxury, a lack of luxury. And you probably, I don't need to explain to you probably that a lack of luxury doesn't necessarily mean that you are poor. Like, so if you don't have a Tesla, it doesn't mean that you are poor. It just might mean that you <laughs> don't have a Tesla or you don't have a, a, you know, a Ferrari or something like that, right? One can be without luxury and not be poor, okay? And, and so I'm lifting this up because I, it goes along with that first point is that the issue at stake for the, the sons of the wealthy who are receiving this instruction is not necessarily the type of impoverishment that we encounter in the Psalms of Lament or in other parts of scripture, but rather what can be lost through dissolute living and bad choices and laziness is luxury. So when the, the Proverbs talks about poverty, it means I think something different than what other parts of the Old Testament means when it talks about poverty. I mean, frankly, it means like, be careful or you'll descend into middle class or something, uh, something like that. Um, but it's not sort of deep impoverishment as we imagine it elsewhere. Um, the last thing I want to say about Proverbs is that despite the, sort of the verses that we saw here uh, on the screen just a moments ago that express these views of poverty being the fault of the poor, that's not the only thing po uh, Proverbs has to say about poverty. In fact, when we zoom out and we kind of get out away from the simple instruction of wealthy dads to their wealthy sons about how not to squander their wealth, we realize that Proverbs actually has other things to say about poverty that really is quite in line with um, uh, the, what we've seen elsewhere in scriptures. Here are just a couple of examples. Um, Proverbs 13, 23, the field of the poor may yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. This is just an observation about how the world works sometimes, that the poor do everything right. They're diligent. They, they harvest well. They do all that they should do to, to, to produce food. And then beyond their control, it's swept away by injustice. Now, it doesn't if, if say what that injustice is. It could be heavy taxes. It could be exploitation. It could be forced labor. It could be a lot of things. But it's acknowledging that, that the effort of the poor even when it produces good results, sometimes can be swept away by injustice. And isn't that true of how we see things today? Sometimes these things like this happen uh, to the poor. Oops. Uh, the second one there, 19.4, wealth brings many friends, but the poor are often left friendless. Isn't this true as well, that poverty is about social standing uh, and social connections as much as it is about the lack of the material things that we need in life? So here the Proverbs are just making um, observations about how things go in society for those who experience poverty. Uh, a few more in this genre, Psalm 22, 9, those who are generous are blessed for they share their bread with the poor, right? So this is acknowledging that in God's eyes, generosity to the poor is considered a virtue. Now, blessed here doesn't mean that God's going to reward them with more money, but in God's eyes, these folks, the folks who are generous with money, uh, are thought to be righteous, are thought to be people of justice. And then some, uh, excuse me, uh, Proverbs 19, 17, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and will be repaid in full. This is a really interesting idea that in giving to the poor, you are actually doing something for God. It's as if 
your gift or your generosity to the poor is a gift to God. It's a sacrifice to God. I think we mentioned earlier in the course that in the Jewish tradition, um, generosity to the poor was eventually thought of as a legitimate substitute for offering sacrifices at the temple. Um, that that was not just seen as an act of social justice, but it was seen giving to the poor. It was seen as a, an act of devotion to God, so much so that it took the place of offering sacrifices at the temple. I think that idea it finds its home in verses like this in Proverbs 19, 17. Uh, the last thing to say about Proverbs uh, is that uh, it, it also lifts up, um, well, it, a lot of other things. It, it, it warns about the danger of redempting to profit off of the poor. Um, and it also lifts up that wisdom should be preferable than material wealth. Wisdom should be preferable to material wealth. So it not only lifts up how you should act towards the poor, but it gives some warnings about placing one's trust in wealth over godly wisdom. Uh, and one place we find that here uh, is in uh, is in 3, 13 to 14, happy are those who find wisdom and those who get understanding for her income. And the her here is personified wisdom. Wisdom is personified as a woman in the Old Testament. Her wisdom's income is better than silver and her revenue is better than gold. So friends, when it comes to what you pursue in life, pursue wisdom over wealth. Better is a little uh, wisdom or better is little with righteousness than large income with injustice. Uh, to be a person of justice in the, in the view of the Proverbs is more virtuous than having a lot of wealth. And then finally in 28.6, better to be poor and walk in integrity than to be crooked in one's ways, even though rich. This is not saying that rich riches are always bad or that if you are rich, you're automatically bad, but it is giving some strong warnings about what we should desire, what we should pursue in life, where we should set our hopes uh, for security and refuge. Uh, according to the Proverbs, it's not in wisdom, or excuse me, not in wealth, but rather it's wisdom. Um, so friends, there's a lot that these texts uh, teach us about poverty that seem odd, but then there's other parts of Proverbs that seem to fit within this trajectory that we've encountered uh, throughout the Old Testament. Um, we, friends, are at time, uh, believe it or not. We have journeyed so far through uh, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, and Proverbs. There's so much more that we could have encountered in all of those parts of scripture, but we also could have turned to other parts of the Old Testament, like Ezra and Nehemiah, um, or we could look more deeply into other prophets, uh, other non-8th century prophets. I hope, uh, friends, that this course begins to just give you some footworks and uh, footholds and frameworks for thinking about this broader issue of poverty, not just where it comes from and what scripture has to say about it. But for me, this course is really meant to be a, a hinge or a lever, a lever that mobilizes you into action into concrete action on behalf of the poor in your community. I hope this course gives you the theological and biblical uh, rationale and motivation and frameworks to support what in the end uh, is, is concrete actions uh, and, and, and modes of justice that support the poor uh, in the communities that you love and serve. Um, again, next week we will continue this study, but we'll be with my colleague Evie as you'll look to Luke Axe. And Luke Axe, by the way, is just sort of a, think of it as a, um, as a case study in what Jesus and the gospels more, uh, writ more largely have to say about poverty. There's probably a whole course on poverty in the gospels uh, that we could do. Remember that what you're getting here is a condensation of a 14 week course. So we have to leave some things out. Um, friends, what a pleasure and what a joy it has been to engage this topic with you. Uh, it's my practice as I've done in previous weeks. Um, I'm gonna hang out for another 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes. If you wanna stay on and chat more informally about this topic, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, but if you need to, move on to your next thing on Sunday, be that worship or something else. Uh, class is uh, officially adjourned. So friends, again, thank you so much. Um, I look forward to ways that we can be in conversation again in the future. So uh, right, stay you. on if you wish. Uh, or, thank you or so much, Brian. Yeah, it's absolutely. one of the best Sunday school.
classes we've ever had. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. That's very kind. Absolutely. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> Ron? Thank you. Could, could I ask a question? Please do. Uh, we always think about ancient peoples as being a, a primitive, um, um, psychologically, emotionally, intellectually. Where did this concern for the poor, what, what is the, what's the human basis for the concern for the poor? It, it, it puzzles me. I mean, it's such a, a you know, it's such a, uh, uh, it becomes so uh, 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 endemic and, and sacrificial to, to certain people. But, but, but what's the uh, civilization's uh, standing? I mean, how did it, who invented the concern for the poor? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess one answer would be God, but I, I, another answer. Oh, well, let's, let's leave him out right now. Okay? Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's fair. Right. You, know, you know what I would say? Him, it, by the guys, way. It's such a good question. Um, I would want to think about it a little bit more, but off the top of my head, I would say that the core of all of this is empathy. It's empathy. I think, and I see that working in two different directions, Charlie. One is this memory of Israel's experience in Egypt. They had this encounter where the whole people were impoverished. They, like writ into their history of who they were as a people is this massive and debilitating experience of slavery and economic impoverishment under Pharaoh. And I think that's why so often, especially in the law, um, it, it's, it's this memory of Egypt mm. that's, that's sort of mobilizing the people to say, like, we can't be that way. We can't inflict those same systems on our people because we know what it's like to be poor. We know what it's like huh. to face this. So let's not do that. Um, and I, I, I want to call that empathy. Now, maybe there's a better word for it, but it's that connection with a real experience of impoverishment, at least historically, that I think is at the, the, the core of it. And they were the only people in ancient history that cared about the poor? Well, not exactly. Um, if you look at the laws of Hammurabi or other Mesopotamian kings, there are laws on the books about uh, helping the poor. Uh, but there are two main distinctions uh, in that, in those laws in comparison to scripture. One is that the concern, well, maybe three. One, that there are just not as many, uh, the, the concern for the poor in other ancient law codes is not as pronounced as it is in the Old Testament. So it's there, but not there in equal measure. That's one. Two, concern for the poor in ancient law codes was, um, was, uh, only for citizens. If you were a, a stranger or an alien or a refugee, the laws for the poor did not protect you. So it was much more ethnocentric in other law codes, whereas in the Old Testament, it expands concern for the poor uh, to strangers, people who are living in Israel as refugees. And then the third piece um, that's really distinctive for ancient Israel is that this whole theology piece of like, this is what Yahweh is about. Like this is part of Yahweh's profile. To my knowledge, the same is not true of any ancient Near Eastern gods. Um, there are gods of justice in the ancient world, but that justice is not often particularized around economic issues or, or the poor in particular. Uh, Ryan, in the in the both the Proverbs and the uh, Psalms that uh, you discuss with us, uh, it implies are they at least the writer seemed to imply that uh, good things will happen to you if you obey these uh, basic rules or, or, or norms uh, yeah, yeah. About, about being wealthy. Uh, it it seemed to me there'd be some danger in assuming that, well, if, those, if you did those things and nothing good did happen to you, then you <laughs> must be doing something bad, you know, and there's a, there's a risk associated with, uh, with you know, the yeah. good things happen to, you know, you read the book, mm -hmm. I'm sure most people have uh, bad things happen to good people. Mm -hmm. And it's such a great understanding of the way the world works uh, without, you know, giving up your theology or your, you know, your faithfulness, right. uh, but just accepting what happens. And yeah. uh, it, and maybe the Proverbs and the Psalms, uh, you know, 
I mean, they don't allude to that. You know, they say that, you know, you do, you've got to do these things in order to, you know, have your uh, vats full of wine and your fields full of grain. Yeah, so there's two, two thoughts on that, Reynolds. One is, um, remember, that this is what Job's, quote unquote, friends try to convince him of, right? They see his life not going well. And so they say, well, you must have done something wrong. And Job right. says, no, I haven't. Like mm -hmm. bad things happen to a good person. Uh, and the friends are, are just insistent that that can't be the way it is. But that's the whole, one of the whole points of the book of Job is to, is to say, no, bad things do happen to good people. And that, that, that's part of the reality. I, another thing I wanna say is that, you know, when we hear in Proverbs and Psalms and other places, kind of what sounds like a health and wealth gospel, like do well, do something good, help the poor, and things will go well with you. We often think of that as like, okay, Reynolds does something nice, and then God sort of zaps him uh, a, a present or a blessing, right? It's very transactional. Like, um, But another way to think of it, and I think this is often what more of what the Old Testament has in mind, I think it's saying this, in a society, in a community in which people help those in need, things do go better for you because that's a healthier community, right? A community in which the poor are supported and uplifted, it, that's not actually in the end just good for the poor. I think the Old Testament is saying that's good for everyone. All of society is a better place. I'll give you an example in the... Um, in, in, in the, uh, the, the Ten Commandments where it says, honor your father and mother, um, it goes on and says, so that your days might be long in the land. Now, again, this is a place where I don't think it's saying if you honor your father and mother, God's going to supernaturally like add 20 years to your life as a sort of like divine blessing. I think what God, I think that verse is saying, look, in a society in which mothers and fathers are honored, even into their own age, their old age, and are supported in their own old age, in a society where that's normative, then you will live longer because guess what? Your kids will honor you in your old age and support you in your old age. So it's kind of, it's not a divine supernatural gift as much as is a reflection of healthy societies are ones in which everyone benefits from the care for the least and the marginalized. So, and that's different than a health and wealth gospel, right? That's more of like a natural sure. consequence or a societal consequence of living out this ethic in the way that the Old Testament describes. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a call to see the bigger picture. Yes. Instead of the, you know, the, the individual picture that, you, that affects you, but see the bigger picture. Excellent. Hard to do. Yeah. yeah, 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 it is, it is. Hey, Ryan, is there a way to, I mean, from my way of looking at this, there's, it's a little paternalistic for us to tell a poor person that they can't have some influence on their own uh, circumstances and that yeah. it's all systemic and, you know, don't blame yourself. It's, it's somebody else has caused you to be in that position. Now, that may be true to a large extent that that's the, the main operative force, but it still seems like it, that we need to find a way without condemning a person to encourage mm -hmm. the sorts of things that might have a beneficial impact on their lives and their, their status. Yeah, that's that such fair? a great insight. Oh, absolutely, Tom. It's more than fair. It's, it's really important. And we, I, I think in churches, in their you know, ministries to the poor, I think inadvertently, I do not think this is intentional. I think many of the ways we try to serve the poor is very paternalistic. Because we just sort of assume that all that the poor can do is receive our handouts, uh, that we are the only ones who can solve the problem, and they just have to receive our gifts. Now, I, n there are not bad intentions in, in almost every case I know of, uh, but I think we can become less paternalistic if through our ministries of charity and our ministries of service, we can start thinking about how do we, how do we involve those who we're, we are serving uh, in, in this work? How do we bring dignity and agency? How, or how do we help activate dignity and agency among them? Um, and so that they're not just passive recipients, but they are actively participating in their own relief from poverty, right? Now, we might be providing some structures and some support to do that, 
Um, and so I think that's, I mean, I'm a hundred percent with you on that time that we got to be really careful about, um, about just saying you don't have agency in this process. And that's, there's a fine line there between saying you're poor because you're lazy or you're poor be, and it's a hundred percent your fault. And then losing sight of the agency that, that those who are experiencing poverty can have to move out of their, their own impoverishment. So it's a, it's a delicate point, but I think it's one that scripture invites us to, uh, to negotiate. So maybe the uh, of, of Proverbs can be redirected and repurposed uh, to a different audience. 